Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Randy Horton, Chief Solutions Officer at Orthogonal. Uh, very briefly about Orthogonal, we are a software consulting firm that helps medical device manufacturers accelerate the development of software as a medical device, connected device systems, and digital therapeutics. Uh, the way we help organizations do that, uh, by the way, to improve patient outcomes faster, I should say, is by fusing the best of modern product management and software engineering tools and techniques with our industry's historic focus on safety and effectiveness. Uh, we have a great turnout today. I think this may be our, well, it's certainly our highest registration and attendee number uh, in a while. So we're thrilled that so many of you are here. Uh, we don't take it for granted that you're giving us an hour or more of your day. And we're gonna try and return the favor by packing is, I'm sorry for those of you who heard this line before, but a good four plus hours of content into, a, into an hour. Um, we organize webinars once a month to convene experts from industry uh, and other manufacturers, advices, and, and other services firms, really trying to share best practices around um, accelerating the development of medical device software and SAMD specifically. Our goal today, we want you to leave with a couple of new gold nugget insights you can use in your own work. We're really looking to give you an overview of kind of why is generative AI different or the same as other new technologies that have been introduced in the past and how might they be incorporated into medical devices and what does the roadmap look like? Because it's not going to be an instant on situation and really give you a framework, hopefully, for thinking about this in the context of your own work. Um, we're going to have a discussion with the panelists for about 50 minutes. And at that point, you're welcome to leave when the hour's done. We do go as long as the questions are there up to 90 minutes. Sometimes we get a full 80, 90 minutes of questions and actually about 40% of the people historically stay on to the end, which is great with questions. Um, I'm going to ask first that our two panelists today introduce themselves. We'll start with Clay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clay Anselmo. I'm a quality and regulatory professional. I've been in medical devices, human tissue, biologics, combo products for about, for more than 30 years, um, both on the uh, regulatory submission side, as well as the post-market compliance and quality assurance stuff. Uh, recently in my career, I've been working on products for, gosh, I guess the last seven or eight years, primarily that contain AI ML technologies. And I have a, a background in software as a medical device and embedded software. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm here to sort of speak on the regulatory challenges that uh, may be presented by generative AI. Great. Well, Clay, we're glad to have you. You're always a great contributor. In fact, I, I have to check, this may be your fifth time joining us on a webinar, which in Saturday Night Live terms means that you join the Five Timer Club and you get a smoking jacket and get to meet like um, Paul Simon and, you know, and, and Adam Sandler in the back room or something. Um, so An orthogonal smoking jacket. There you go. There you yeah, go. Something yeah. like that. You know, the, nice private, the private Five Timer Club room for orthogonal. It'll be a Zoom room, but you know. All right, Bernhard, who are you? Welcome. Uh, let's see. So I am actually a an AI generated uh, talking head. Uh, I was originally uh, uh, called Max Headroom uh, back in the day, and then uh, I've evolved since then. So um, no, actually, so I'm Bernhard Kapp. I'm the uh, uh, founder and CEO of uh, Orthogonal. Um, and have been in, you know, the software space for a long time and medical devices uh, for about the last uh, 15 years or, or so and seen certainly the evolution of various uh, technologies, a lot more evolution, a lot less revolution, which is probably going to be the theme here uh, today with a couple of exceptions. So. Great. Well, welcome. And for those of you who are not in Gen X, you can Google Max Headroom. It was MTV's 80s attempt at what a digital, I don't know, it was an avatar, just a digitally generated being would look like. It was rather silly. Um, but then again, some of the stuff we see today with AI is rather silly. So uh, I'll start with just a little background. I mean, we can't escape generative AI. I think we were almost reluctant to do a webinar on it because everybody's doing a webinar on generative AI. Um, but we, we started to hear from people asking us to do one, which is great. Um, and really, because it was sort of the intersection of two sets of concerns. One was we were hearing people say, generative AI will never be able to be used in medical devices. It's too weird and wacky, so we should just cross it off our list. The other one was somebody actually, well, one person specifically called and said, I've been doing some really good, diligent work now for a couple of years on a machine learning algorithm that I'm getting regulated. And there's these jokers out there 
creating generative AI to try and solve the same problem, claiming it's not a medical device and bringing it to market. So could you please explain to everybody, you can't just slam anything and anything and generative AI into anything and bring it forth as a medical device or as a non-medical device if it's actually doing medical device functions. So we're here to strike the balance in the me in, in the middle. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of give the high level over you, which is uh, generative AI may become a very powerful technology for medical devices starting and it eventually may become a very powerful technology in medical devices, but it's not an instant on, it's not a guarantee. It's a, still a relatively new technology. I mean, ChatGPT, I looked up, was only introduced like 18 months ago, which is you know kind of crazy. Um, but it will happen. And so we should be thinking about what is the role going to look like and, and how can we take, how might we take advantage of it and what should we be cautious about? Um, so we've convened a couple of people here, you know, Bernhard and Clay, who have been in this industry for a while, have seen a lot of new technologies come, including uh, ML um, and probably even older school AI, pre-ML AI, to talk about this. Um, so let me start at a high level for, for, for you two. Um, what is a tech, any technology, a new materials coding, a battery, a new electrical mecha a mechanical method, what do those need to be able to be good enough to be in a medical device? A method to address the new risks posed by the technology, right? To a, to a level that FDA believes that uh, the benefits outweigh those risks. I don't think you have to eliminate them, but you, uh, you have to be able to address them. And I, I think part of the problem with generative AI is that there are risks that we're not necessarily sure how to mitigate. And there's a lack of, there's a lot of opacity in the algorithms that, that make it difficult to use our traditional methods of, of validation to, uh, uh, in an effective way to show that the product's gonna provide safe, maybe less so effectiveness, but safe uh, outputs. So, you know, like, like anything else, it starts with um, the, the, what what is new about this thing and how does it go wrong because that's how regulators think right their reward system is set up primarily to reward not making big mistakes um and i won't say that you know uh, across the board all of them behave the same i think there's always um you know a, a motivation for breakthrough technologies and and some of it's politically motivated but a lot of it is Look, they want to do good things, and they want to, and they want to make sure things are safe. Um, but when rubber hits the road, the, the safety always trumps uh, everything else. And so, in approaching regulators uh, about how to do this, about how to do any new technology, I think you you you've got to come with a story that um, puts the technology in a paradigm that they can understand and addresses the risks. Uh, it's funny. There's a. Uh classic Dilbert cartoon, sorry, another Gen X uh, <laughs> reference for pop culture. I'm gonna have to work on my younger ones, get some for my kids, but where Dilbert attends like a, a career day at an elementary school or middle school. And he says, I'm an engineer. The goal of every engineer is to graduate or to, to retire without being blamed for a major disaster. Um, so maybe could you guys walk us through like, AI has been in medical devices for a couple of decades now. What was different between sort of the first round of AI, which is sort of pre-ML AI that was used in things, you know, like a breast cancer diagnosis to the introduction of machine learning? And what's different about generative AI? You know, why, why is this not just more of the same? So maybe I can uh, take this, right? A lot of the sort of core concept here for generative AI versus what came before is, is kind of the concept of foundational models, uh, right? Which are types of machine learning or deep learning models that are trained on really broad data sets so that they can be applied across a wide range of use cases. So it's really the idea is a foundational model is a general purpose tool, lots and lots and lots of data and then generative AI works on top of that uh, and generates things. So text, images, videos, um, other kinds of data using those foundational models and uh, learn the structure of that input training data. And then they generate 
um, new data that has similar characteristics. So it's, you know, uh, it, it's kind of like we've been doing. It's the same things that we've been doing in terms of uh, deep learning and machine learning, but we're using uh, kind of lots and lots of large data sets uh, in order to train those across different things. And then typically they're kind of prompt driven uh, types of tools. So unlike where we were before, uh, where we we're using AI, you know, conceptually, you can always generate some kind of an algorithm, you know, build it by hand, et cetera. Or you can sick an AI <laughs> machine learning at it to get to things you might not have constructed faster and be able to sort of train and then validate on that. So uh, a lot of people used to construct algorithms and then later on just use the AI because we get better algorithms faster, right? That's where we were before and that's how we've used it in the medical device space heavily, right? In, in medical devices. The difference here is this is kind of an open-ended uh, general purpose tool. And that's, we don't really have a paradigm for dealing with that within the medical device space, right? There are so many ways that you would have to go test the inputs, test the outputs, et cetera, uh, in order to be able to use that, you know, as is, as a, you know, prompt engine. Uh, I think that's the fundamental difference. It's not uh, as is if you think of putting chat GPT inside of a medical device as a, or it is the medical device with some, you know, as a prompt engine as is. That is nowhere in the paradigms that we have for how we uh, test and validate medical devices. Whereas the things we have right now can fit in and there's been a lot of hard work to fit those in so like the the father of deep learning and neural networks said somebody asked him how does it work and his famous answer is we don't know so if we don't know how it works how could we already be using machine learning and you know for for clinical decision making and those kinds of things in medical device where help me understand a little bit more about the, the difference between that that unknown and a generative ai unknown if you, you know, Randy, if you generalize, a lot of what we've done with ML and medical devices is this categorization of things, right? Where, where you say, I have something, uh, a radiological image, and I want to know if something in it looks like something I'm interested in, cancer, some lesion type. These, this is a common usage, right? It's that, is it similar? Um, and that's classically been our use case not so much the fill in the blank or generate something new. Um, it, it's, look, this idea of making something new out of something, a, a large data set that is, okay, generative AI typically operates on sort of these unlabeled, uncategorized large data sets and using them to create something new and interesting, right? That's sort of the opposite of what we've been doing. We've had fixed data sets pre-labeled or pre-truth used to train an algorithm to then, for the most part, do some categorization of something to say it, it is either like something or not like something, right? It's either got an area of interest or it's this type of tissue or, or you know, this thing that we're interested in. And we have even though the algorithm itself is rather opaque, we verify and validate it using large statistical, statistically based sets of uh, data not used for training to evaluate in a classic VNV model the, the output and whether the output is correct, right? And these are locked algorithms classically, right? These are not continuously learning. Um, and now we will probably see FDA has proposed a framework and many regulators proposed a framework for continuously learning, but the classic model is a fixed set of inputs, a fixed set of outputs and a locked algorithm, right? And that more fits our paradigm for something we can test 
in a reasonable way to reduce the risk that the output is going to go off the rails. Do we have those tools today for generative AI? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think it's also kind of because it is such a general purpose tool and, and uh, you know, quantifying the inputs and the outputs and being able to essentially have an analog way of testing these things, right? Not using AI to test the AI uh, uh, type of thing, right? Right now, we don't have good methods. It's It would be really, really, really hard, really expensive and we can't be certain that we're testing everything that needs to be tested, nor how to assign risks to the uh, risk of us missing something, right? We don't have those right now, those tools for, for determining that, right? Right. So I'm going to ask one more question on this topic, but I want to say to the audience, this is not the end. The answer is not, you can't use it. Goodbye. We'll see you in 15 years. We're going to talk about a whole range of in-between things on this roadmap. But first, let's talk about just quickly. So we actually, we had a background conversation with somebody who's with one of the big tech, big AI companies who's specifically working at the intersection, intersection of medical, clinical, and generative AI, not necessarily medical device, but clinical. And their comment was, we will be able at some point probably to do some really serious heavy research to figure out how to validate these models, but it is gonna be a lot of time and a lot of money and our question back to him was, who's going to be able to afford that kind of money? And it, I think the perspective he gave, but I'll ask you guys to comment, was, um, well, it'll be two things. You're, you're going to have to have a use case that's got a big enough uh, market size to justify the investment. Um, yeah. You're not going to do it for a, a rare disease. Um, but you're going to have to have really deep pockets. And it may be that if you look at least at the players today, the only ones with those kinds of pockets who could speculatively invest are going to be those big tech companies. But I, I asked you two for a comment on that. Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I would say that, that that's, that's the case. The question is in this space though, um, is, you know, what makes it worth it when and how is it worth it? Right. Um, and just because you can doesn't mean you're going to spend that kind of money uh, in this space, especially if if what we're doing, it, it, our paradigm is low risk, incremental change kind of work, right? I mean, just look at where we are right now with, with just continuous uh, 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 learning, right? The FDA, based on pressure uh, from folks that theoretically could do this, right, in in the imaging space where the gold standard for evaluating something is two radiologists looking at something, so you can evaluate your AI against that. Theoretically, you could have a continuous learning model with all of the bounds because you're basically doing the work um, in order to, you know, validate uh, improvements to the model uh, you know, real time, right? So there was the pre-cert uh, pilot program. And then within the framework of that, the FDA in 2019 came up with a position paper on uh, how uh, you could do continuous online learning, right? Now that was a position paper um, and we've had sort of the concept of PCCP, et cetera. We've had lots of algorithms and theoretically this is, this is doable. That was five years ago. How many continuous online learning algorithms have gotten through the FDA? Zero, right? The next one will be the first. We may be able to see something with, you know, with things written in, uh, uh, to law that allowed the the FDA to have the PCCP guidance that we may see that, but the next one will be the first. And uh, Clay, you think that's twenty twenty four? Look, I don't have a magic crystal ball, uh, but that is certainly an achievable goal. I think a continuous yeah. learn. I think that's the next step in the evolution of this technology and medical devices. I, I really do, and I. 
I, 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 my experience with the new technologies has always been, you're more successful with the regulators if you do it incrementally in bites that they can, that present a level of risk that they can tolerate. And as more products come on the market that take that step, then there's, then they get more comfortable. The, the methodologies of, of testing and risk reduction get more sophisticated. Then, then there's a next step. I don't really see, I don't see a market driver for somebody to, to take a giant revolutionary step that's going to take seven, 10 years and cost a billion dollars. I don't see a market need for that. To me, the biggest advantage for generative AI is in processes within med tech that could be optimized and, and more efficient, writing software code, um, managing development uh, processes. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of places where the, the advantage of generative AI in processes could be um, realized without it being in the product itself. And uh, so I, yeah, I don't, I don't see a, I'm sure people are working on it, but I don't yeah. see a short term path to a giant revolution where generative AI becomes a, a, a clear like 510K or even de novo pathway in the next couple of years. I don't see it. Yeah, we, we, we talked about this uh, in, in a meeting er that we had earlier. It's like really, you know, where really breakthrough things end up sort of getting through more quickly is when there is a crisis, right? So so I, I, I think we talked about mRNA vaccines, right? Without COVID, there was no way that those mRNA vaccines would, would have actually gotten mm -hmm. through in any timeline and been... I mean, they were expensive, obviously, to produce, but it was a crisis. And if you looked at the risk reward in this case, it's like the risk compared to the reward uh, in a pandemic like this, where we lost a million Americans and I don't know how many around the world uh, was, you know, allowed that to come through. Otherwise, we'd be waiting another 10, 20 years for, uh, uh, for someone like the FDA to to green light this stuff, right? Very long-term studies, et cetera. So I think well, we have a lot of fun with the, what would what it take to get there today for yeah. next year? Mm -hmm. But maybe if we could zoom in on some of those, Clay, you started talking about the use cases of ways that people are or trying or could be using generative AI today. And and I, I'd appreciate it because I think a lot of people, I still feel like I'm, I'm I still haven't fully wrapped my mind around what generative AI is. I've read a use case. I'm like, well, how do you use generative AI for that? So maybe you could talk a little bit about sort of the before and after. What what would generative AI bring to a person working on a medical device? You know, maybe you know? I can start with one that's outside of medical device and sort of illustrate there, and then sort of extrapolate from that. So I am actually gonna, if I am allowed to, I'm gonna share some music with you. Okay. Can you guys see my screen here? 18 summers. 18 summers. I'm going to play this song. All right, I'm going to play another one. All right, you get the idea of this. This is actually music by Lil D and the Funky Fellas. Um, that's my brother's uh, <laughs> musical alias. He uh, does um, uses AI uh, for training and improving chess engines during the day. Uh, but he's been an amateur musician for, you know, since he was a teenager uh and does a lot of writing songs and performing etc so you know good guitar player uh banjo uh songwriting etc and he's been writing songs for my kids birthdays uh for a very long time right 
And in this case, I have a now a 16 year old and an 18 year old. And these used to be songs where he would write them, he'd perform perform them, he'd do all the tracks, etc. Um, and then over time, that's evolved more. He's done more and more electronic music, synthetic uh, kind of stuff. And this last set here, those are obviously not my, that's not my brother's voice. Um, and those are not real instruments. And the album art is also AI generated. And he did a lot of, you know, interviewing my daughters on uh, kind of their musical tastes and what they cared about. And he experimented with all kinds of things in terms of writing lyrics uh, where he would use uh, chat GPT and particular styles based on who they liked and would would use prompt based stuff to help write the lyrics that part didn't work so well he just said the lyrics were terrible <laughs> and super cheesy so he ended up doing just a little bit of help from from uh from the um uh from chat GPT for that uh, but in terms of the the voices uh, and the styles, more and more of this stuff was really lots and lots of experiments with generative AI to get uh, to get these songs out, right? So I think that is kind of illustrative of a lot of ways that people are using generative AI. And if we, look at that in the medical device space you could even look at something like there uh, there is for example uh, a medical device that uses hypnotism therapy um uh for um uh for a particular uh, chronic uh, disease right fda cleared um and they use recorded voices to do the hypnotism there's nothing that would prevent you to try different AI generated voices to see if some of them are more useful for hypnotism. Or if you have music therapy, the ability to generate and test out lots of different things. That's an example of something that you could do. In the same way as my brother is using uh, AI to sort of help him in terms of generating a song that he thinks my kids would like, you can do that kind of thing. Software developers do this now to great effect to actually get much more productive if they have generative AI sort of companions uh, to in their development process. Okay, so let, let's go through some specific use cases that are important in med tech because they cost, take time, money, or error prone, right? <laughs> Or you could do, what, is it working faster? Is it working with higher quality? Is it is it coming up with ideas you would never have come up with? Let's let's talk about, um, let's take a couple. So one we, we talked about was auto-generating the coding. Another one was auto-generating test cases or test code, right? So let, let's dig into those two. Would, why would you so, say that? Yeah, let's talk. The code one is, you know, is fairly straightforward. It's being done now, um, where again, uh, the the uh, the simplest thing is as you're coding, your AI assistant is noticing certain things and pointing out when you may have missed something, uh, or uh, or even being able to sort of generate certain things for you that you can bring uh, into your code, right? That is something that works pretty well in the paradigm uh, that we have. It could be that that code is then in a medical device. And the reason for that is we have really lots of good sort of risk uh, reward kind of you know, good mitigations around this, right? If you think about how you're doing this, is all that code, uh, you have design inputs and you have design outputs and you're measuring, uh, you're measuring that. You are putting that code into uh, uh, at check-in, going through CICD, uh, does it pass unit tests? Does it pass the behavioral tests, et cetera? All of that testing, all of the integration tests, 
the code quality is something that you can measure. You're also, you know, likely have uh, have things around static and uh, dynamic code analysis. Mm -hmm. This is basically a tool that helps you be more productive. People are say 30, 40 percent more productive as developers and better code quality, fewer errors, et cetera. The risk is pretty low in, in cases like that, as long as you have all of those things around it, right? So that's a great example where, where I think that, you know, I don't see any problems with using those uh, technologies and having AI generated code in your medical device um, because the, the risks are, are extremely low and the benefits are, are very high. So the benefits could be you could go faster it could be kind of like Excel when it says, hey, you have an inconsistent formula here. Did you mean to do that or not? So it might catch something you didn't think of. Or it might fewer say errors, that fewer anomalies. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And more time actually spent dealing with, you know, the hard things and improving improving the quality of your, uh, of your product, right? Right. On the other hand, if it screwed up and suggested some code, which actually was inherently insecure and didn't follow best practices, you're saying there's you you still have to have a good engineering organization, good processes, and good people to catch that the way you normally would. Right, you would less. You would still have uh you know pull requests and code reviews by people in addition to code reviews likely by you know by machine generated things. That's what really like if you think about static and dynamic code analysis, this is a machine that is analyzing. Uh, uh, analyzing your code, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's a whole bunch of AI that is uh, that is part of uh, part of that tooling uh, that is out there as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I think Randy, at the end of the day, that gets back to we have great QC QA measures that can catch potential problems, and you know, the advantage there is it's a process efficiency. Uh, increase right and that's when i said earlier i think that the application of of this is fundamentally today in process improvement not so much in in the actual product but those are two great examples of places where um you can automate something that could be done faster and more efficiently and doesn't really introduce significant new additional risks i mean it is is ai generative ai code any worse than human developed code Probably not. If, if anything, it may be better generally. So, you know, but if, if, if you stand back and say, what are other areas? There's a lot of processes like that. Let's talk about labeling development. Let's talk about training materials. We could talk about even writing uh, regulatory submissions. All of these things have good checks and balances, but you could create them faster, especially large. I mean, you know, you talk about a thousand page or or even 10,000 page regulatory submission, much of which is done by rote, right? Um, could could be done fundamentally by by a, a piece of generative AI. I don't know. I think there, those are very and, interesting use cases. Or even just, if you think about that, the the analogy from the, the software development, right? If you're thinking about, you know, user needs, requirements, right? Uh, testability test cases, all of those types of trace, things. trace matrices, trace matrices uh, et cetera, uh, yeah. development plans, like all, all of these things are have tremendous opportunity. Documentation creation in general, where it's very templatized and and there's a body of work that you can train on, is perfect, perfect opportunity for this. Yeah, sure. and there are things that you would you know where. Thinking of it as augmenting humans, yeah. there are, especially if you have, you have lots and lots of requirements and lots of things where potentially, oh, we missed this requirement as we're developing this. We discover this later and it's the 200th one of these that we are developing, we can learn from those things. Typically people miss these requirements. Let's make sure we have these in here. You can generate those, you can have those available for humans to sort of to augment where we miss things. And that's especially for things like edge cases and the, the weird corner case kind of things that, 
you know, you learn through experience, right? Um, I think those are all things that you, that where you can use this to make your, your products better, right? Generating yeah. synthetic data for, uh, for testing, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting one of taking a fixed, a small fixed data set and using generative AI to create additional test cases, additional input cases, millions of them possibly, right? Where, hey, I've got a data set, it's only got a hundred elements. I need 10,000. Can I take a hundred and extrapolate into 10,000 test cases? Absolutely, I could. And, and assuming that, you know, you don't have a lot of hallucinations in that data set, or you have ways to filter out the, the ones that don't fit a set of parameters, like, your things like a standalone performance assessment of a, of a AI model could, could be much better. I mean, you, you could get a, a much higher confidence in the performance of your, of your, of a traditionally generated ML algorithm. If you had many more test cases, right. Uh, that is really interesting. So, so to, to, to clarify on a point you made there, which I think is really interesting is you can use like if, you have 50 chest x-rays of a specific thing that you're developing an algorithm for, but you need 5,000. You can create 49, 50, 40, 4, ones that are essentially derivative combinations. But you do have, what I think you said is you do have to watch out to make sure you're not getting the equivalent of a hallucination where it generates an x-ray of something that's actually that particular combination is physiologically impossible, for instance, right? Absolutely. But I mean, th th these are the problems that we're trying to solve with this technology today. But I, I think in general, e even there is a way to, to QA or QC those kinds of things reasonably um, to, to, to make that data set a valid data set, especially if it's a test data set rather than a training data set, right? If you, if you ran all those through the test data set, um, ones that were as a test data set, ones that were outliers probably ought to get kicked out by your, by your traditional algorithm, you right. know, but th these are the kinds of things that occur to me where, where we start with something that's a moderate size or even small size and be able to create something of a larger size. That's very useful in the development process. This is a perfect technology for let, let's pause for a public service announcement, which unfortunately needs to get made every time <laughs> AI and data sets, which is, folks, if, you're, if your data set that you're starting from for generative AI is not representative of the human beings and their bodies that you're going to do, then the, the, what's der derived off of it is going to be significantly expanded, but still not representative. So that, that doesn't, it doesn't mean you can only train on men and generate women. <laughs> um, so, all right, so you... Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the, the important the important thing here, right? And we've seen this with 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 you know drift in 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 generative AI and things where it sort of continues to learn based on you know input that isn't quality controlled, right? I mm. think there is really kind of thinking about the quality of the data that are inputs uh, to your process and your models, right? Um, just because you have a large uh, a large data set and you can draw inferences from uh, uh, from those, if those uh, if you know that whole thing <laughs> is uh, is not really you know grounded in science and in fact, et cetera, you know, you could come up with uh, with uh, you know a great you know, medieval philosophy arguments for all kinds of uh, different things that make sense within a certain worldview that may have nothing to do with uh, uh, with science and uh, with with ultimately patient safety, right? Okay, so you guys, I want to, before we wrap this up, I want to, you guys have pointed out two, essentially two pieces of value. One, it can save time. Two, it can improve quality, which may be the opposite of saving time, because if it gives you a whole bunch of quality suggestions, you have to stop and go through. Your ultimate document is better, but it may have actually taken you longer to get through that stuff. I think with automation, you can automate a lot of that quality kind of 
testing, et cetera, as well, right? I think there's there's a lot of that where it's complementary to the things we would do anyway, which is automate the hell out of everything in terms of testing, right? So every so, place uh, that we, we learn iteratively, every place we learn iteratively is an opportunity for this to, to, to be a, a way to do it faster and more effectively. I'll say to our audience, because we're, we're heading up, I've only seen one question, which we'll address in a minute. But first, I want, I want to talk about a, uh, a third scenario, which was implied, Bernhard, with, with the music you played uh, with, was it Funky D and the Ringtones? Or, uh, <coughs> Little D and the Funky Fellas. So. Little D and the Funky I, I I'm going to stick with Funky D and the Ringtones, I think, or maybe I'll use that for myself, um, which is that most people don't have a sibling who can write customized bespoke songs pre-AI for family members for every birthday. But now with this, it's not just that, that, that Funky D, Little D can do it with less time. It means more people could do it. And in the context of a, a device company, that means they could, is it, it does it mean that highly specialized expertise could become more doable by more people in the company? It's an interesting question. I, I I would say, so there's two ways that I can think of to look at this. One is it makes people who already have really, really strong expertise and skills and discernment more, more productive. They can do more and their stuff can get better. The question of can you make someone with a lot less expertise the equivalent of someone with more expertise that, that is a sounds awesome i don't know about that particular one i think you know again the more bounded something is right the more you can kind of control <laughs> Uh, inputs, outputs, what it is that you're doing, the more you can use that as an assist to have someone with less skill do more, right? But the more open-ended it is, the open-ended stuff is awesome for the expert, but the open-ended stuff, you don't know how to evaluate the inputs, the, the, the open-ended stuff if you don't have the expertise. You don't have a sniff test. Part of the reason this works is because the supervision works and that requires the expertise, right? I mean, all these use cases we're talking about are ones that can be checked, can be supervised. And even look at the, the cases of ML that have gone into medical devices. Many of them are also supervised. They're, they replace one of two reads by a radiologist. They identify a region of interest that is then arbitrated by a human that there's there are checks and balances and supervision and and all of the things we've talked about today their risks are mitigated by some form of that we you take the expertise out of the process then you become much more unsupervised and and then you have risks that are much more difficult to mitigate um we're going to start having people drop off in a few but we've got plenty of uh, questions that were submitted beforehand, I want to get, um, please send them in. Lacey, we'll get to yours next. Um, and I want to thank everybody who joined. Next month, we'll be announcing late June, we are doing a webinar on the topic of uh, uh, predefined, predefined, predetermined change control plans, PCCP, which is sort of a, a cousin to this one. We've been getting a lot of questions, and I think a lot of people are getting really excited about what this is opening up. So we will see you back next month if we uh, don't see you through the end today. Okay, so... Uh, Lacey, asked, Lacey Harbour, hi Lacey, asked a great question and I'm gonna use that, I'm gonna tack on, on a couple of the questions that people had asked. Um, what are your thoughts about MHRA's communication around LLMs and device in their AI airlock program, which I believe is a, some kind of a, a regulatory sandbox program. More broadly, is this gonna play out the same way in different regulatory jurisdictions, US versus EU versus UK versus Japan, Australia, China, wherever? Randy, you, you're going to catch me cold. I don't. I don't have. An, I don't have any knowledge about that. I'm sorry. My apologies. Do you want to ask ChatGPT for an answer and get back? Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, that's the way to go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's 
honestly, I, I don't have a good answer to that yet. Uh, it's interesting. I will just say it's interesting that, you know, Great Britain is sort of branching out and trying something <laughs> around this in terms of the ability to kind of ask and answer some of these questions, uh, which is, to my mind, uh, kind of branching out a little bit from uh, sort of, we'll do whatever the EU is doing, right? Um, but I think it's just experimental at this point. Um, certainly would love to, you know, hear others, anyone's experience with that yeah. and where that, where that is going. But having sandboxes to experiment in and ask and answer questions sounds like a good way for regulators to get more comfortable with the problem sets and, and for interaction to take place around it. And there are examples of other sandboxes that have come up in, in the U.S. as well, right? So it's there's precedent for kind of saying you're in this program and within certain boundaries, we're going to have a little more latitude and we're going to have a lot more communication, and just kind of figure it out, right? That's essentially the idea. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would be shocked if and something came out of this that was not, you know, that was... Like I say, the most likely thing, things to come out, right, regardless of sandboxes and various other things, I think those are great for, for kind of helping us understand things better. But the most likely thing are, you know, either inputs, process, or outputs of, uh, uh, of generative AI that are in medical devices rather than generative AI engine <laughs> foundational model in the core of uh, of a medical device. If, however, that is going to be in there, the it's going to end up the first things are going to be really, really bounded, right? So you're yes, you have a foundational model, et cetera, but we're really, really limiting uh, limiting the scope of what we're doing and uh, and the scope of the uh, of uh, of the AI, at which point you're like, is it really generative <laughs> AI based on a foundational model, or is it is it really sort of much closer to traditional AI? Right. The more you bound it, the less that's going to be the case. You know, Randy. Also, remember that you know that lots of times in the past, if you look at history as a predictor for future, there's been lots of initiatives. Uh, by various regulators across the world that have been designed to accelerate access to, you know, innovative technologies. I hate to say it, but many of these programs just kind of are blips on the radar before we go back to a more traditional uh, evolutionary methodology, right? And, and part of it is the legal frameworks don't often support many of these. Uh, th they didn't contemplate and don't support revolutionary changes. I, I absolutely salute the regulators for continuing to try to do these things. We, we've had these pilot programs time and time again, but their success has been, in my mind, somewhat limited. And so, you know, you, you we always get that, let's jump on the bandwagon to the next pilot program that comes out. But, but in general, it doesn't change the paradigm of how long and how much uh, it takes to bring something with new types of risks to the marketplace. I'll give an example I know of somebody who was involved with a, uh, a value-based payment model program with CMS, an early one, um, and they've been working on this for months, and it's Friday at 4 p.m., and they're on with the people from CMS who are the regulators, and the CMS people look at and say, this is good. You can start this new value-based model on Monday morning. Let us, you know, keep us posted on how it goes. They said, oh, but by the way, we can't guarantee that the, uh, the Office of the Inspector General um, it, it Department of Health and Human Services won't have you indicted by Monday afternoon for antitrust. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, the, the like I said, the legal framework often doesn't isn't these these innovations are not contemplated, and so you end up with these bare the, these guardrails that that prevent some of this innovation, and then you've got to go back through a rulemaking process, right? And that takes time and uh, political um, capital and will, 
And it's, it's just not that simple. So what do we do? We operate within the bounds and we sort of shift them in small increments, right? Uh, in ways that people feel safe about. So, uh, I mean, that's classically been the paradigm um, in regulatory globally. And, and let's be clear, it's not like the amount of regulation is going down, right? It's like the tax law. It, it, look at the new cybersecurity uh, rules that are coming out globally and privacy and security, we're adding, right? This is not making things faster. Now, certainly it's protecting us, but um, you gotta think about these things in the context of what do the reg what is the primary motivation? And that's is to protect us, not necessarily to always bring the most innovation to market because we have very low tolerance for errors as a, as a society, especially in America. Oh, it's I, an interesting, yeah, sorry, Ryan. Oh, um, you know, I think if you look at it, right, the, in terms of the paradigms of how you might evaluate these things, um, think about cloud computing, right? We, we have sort of, uh, I, I know we're, we're working on uh, uh, some guidance through Amy on how to use cloud computing, but one of the, the issues with sort of like using soup or service or what have you as a paradigm from managing uh, and, and uh, the risks and handling validation, verification, et cetera, for cloud services is there, it's a different paradigm. It's a different thing. And we've been working on how do we do this because the traditional ways don't really work. Soup for example, as a model for manage, for dealing with uh, cloud services, pieces of it, yeah, but not really as is. Now, if you think about, chances are you are not, as a medical device uh, uh, company, building out a foundational large language model. Maybe you are, and some people are, but in a lot of cases, you're using one, licensing it, and that is somehow in your or uh, or used by your medical device. So what's the paradigm for that, right? Soup, that's certainly where people are pointing to and soup mm -hmm. is not going to work for that, you know, uh, because of the general purpose nature of it and the inputs and the outputs, being able to write uh, and say, this is the intended use of of this and being able to validate that using soup. Good luck. I don't think that's going to work, right? It's not a tool. It's that that model for managing uh, soup and OTS software just probably is, it, like you said, elements reasonable, but it's not comprehensive enough to do that. Um, and we've been tightening up our OTS soup software controls for a number of years because we've recognized that that taking that out of the structured development process and just bringing pieces in as a black box is not great, right? It's it's difficult without an assurance of the development methodologies. And so now the regulators are trying to close some of those loopholes as well. You know, I do think you might see generative AI in medical devices in unregulated functions, right? So this whole idea that you can segment a medical device into regulated and unregulated functions and use something like a, 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 an LLM as a part of an unregulated part of the, uh, the, the software system. I think you will see that. And then somebody's going to point to that as, well, this is the first medical device that uses generative AI. Well, yeah, but not really in a regulated way, right? I don't know. It should be really interesting. I would love to be a part of the first one of these to go through the a regulatory process somewhere in the world. It would be really interesting. interesting. Speaking of unintended consequences, my my little vacuum robot that, that has mapped itself mm -hmm. with AI around the house isn't aware that there's a webinar going on and keeps knocking on the door. So you know, there's, <laughs> there's an unintended consequence for you. Um, okay, so two other uh, related scenarios. One's just this kind of a fun one, but interesting. Uh, in background conversations, uh, we spoke to one person who works in biopharma and has worked on, on vaccines, among other things, who said, you know where I think we're going to see a breakthrough in generative AI? 
somebody who's a biohacker at home is going to use it. And then they're going to try come up with an, uh, you know, an answer to some crazy unsolvable medical question and cure themselves with it. And then they're going to try it under two, on two other people. And both those people are going to die. He says, but now the pressure will be up because he actually did cure himself or herself with that. What do you think about that? <laughs> I mean, look, I think there is a, uh, you know, this is again, complementarity, right? Where you have all of these tools that, that allow you to do certain things more cheaply, you know, CRISPR, blah, 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 all of these, uh, these types of things ways of uh, of testing things out where AI or generative AI is complementary to having all of that. You got a lot of data. <laughs> you have uh, a lot of tools for generating uh, uh, new things and you're putting generative AI or et cetera on top of that. You know, potentially an exponential of, uh, effect on those those types of things. I think you know, one of the things that I think in a previous conversation uh, it was said, you have a lot of doctor hackers, not everyone, but you have people that uh, that will sort of like they build their own tools, they do their own things. And in some cases, they're just sort of limited by the fact that I can't really code. So I have to hire someone to do that. But if you can actually using prompts and various things have software built for you, um, you can do things yourself to aid yourself within that. And there's nothing, you know, it's your responsibility as a physician to use that uh, and to use it responsibly, right? Um, and people do this now. They build their own tools. They do, you know, various things uh, as, as part of that. Um, we're trusting them because they are, you know, <laughs> They're, they're, they're medical doctors, they're licensed, all of those things. What happens when someone builds something like that and then they just pass it on to someone else and pass it on and pass it on? It's very, it's much easier because the cost of producing something like that and distributing that is very, very low, right? So they're not saying, I have to hire a developer, so therefore I'm going to have to... Um, I'm going to have to figure out a way to sort of recoup my costs or make money out of this. They could just pass it on. So that is, it a, <laughs> is going to be very interesting so, as a regulator. Yeah, I mean, so right now, if if a uh, well, let's say pre the changes in lab developed tests, if somebody lab develops a test and open sources it and puts it out on GitHub and says any other lab can use it, is that a device? Pre. <laughs> Clay, I don't know. What do you think on that one? Mm, it's supposed that the LDT exemption was supposed to be for things that are developed in-house for their own particular use under a particular set of controls that are not typical FDA controls. It, whether it's a medical device or not is really a definitional thing, right? Whether, how it's regulated is a different question. But if if uh, you know if it's intended to diagnose. Uh, and it doesn't achieve it through chemical means in the U.S. It's a medical device. It's, it's not a consistent definition across the board. But um, if if you're using it for that intended purpose, then it's it's a device. Right. Now, whether or not you need a prior approval for it is a different is a totally different question, right? You know, Randy, you 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 made that comment about oh, I cured myself and then I killed two people. Like, let's also hope that we don't have a major health emergency with any of these products that already contain ML, right? I mean, you want to set this, you want to set this back five years. Let's have a problem with one of the existing, we've had really good momentum. We've had a, a, quite a few devices uh, cleared and they're regularly now being cleared through the, not the de novo process, but through the traditional 510k process. And, and that's in my mind, a good thing. I, I think, um, it's, it's going to be very helpful, especially in certain, uh, particular niches, but let's hope we don't have a big problem because the one thing that the public doesn't tolerate and the regulators don't tolerate is a major misstep in a technology, right? Um, and you look back to breast implants and metal on metal hips and these kinds of things that have, uh, and infusion pumps and these kinds of things that have set industries back 
for isolate what, what I would consider to be reasonably isolated uh, problems. Um, you know, we might see that right. with mRNA vaccines, right? Uh, you might, right? You, you very well might. And that was a situation, like you mentioned, where we had a wonderful catastrophe that provided an opportunity for a leap forward in revolutionary technology with a low bar for entry. Let's hope we didn't make a big mistake because that's the, that is the trade-off, right? You get it fast. You, get, you might get something that's, that's absolutely effective and revolutionary, and there's a lot of uncharacterized risks and what, what ends up happening in the end. And, and you may see that in this, you may see a, a, a public health emergency somewhere where a, a big one, big enough one where a regulator makes the determination that there is a generative AI technology that can help it. Right. Um, yeah. And it might be diagnosis or it might be, it's probably going to be in a diagnostic uh, scenario, but I, I, God, I, let's I not make so. a big it's, mistake. It's going to come down in a lot of cases, right. You know, even if something is not a uh, a medical uh, device regulated as a medical device or making any claims to being a medical device. But let's say, you know, you get to the point where, you know, moms are, uh, and dads, you know, with little kids at home are relying on chat GPT to tell them what to do and what not to do, right? It just becomes part of a habit of population. I trust this, this does, good, et cetera. And then they, uh, and then for whatever reason, <laughs> you end up with, uh, with, uh, you know, with the answer that, you know, give them some bleach, that'll cure it, right? Uh, uh, as a result, now this, this, this comes through, right? It's not regulated, no one's making any claims, but people are actually using it for certain purposes that, weren't foreseen, right? That's what can happen when you have really powerful uh, technology that is that is unregulated, right? And you try to do safeguards around it, but you know, those things you will discover new things like uh, like folks did with uh, with ChatGPT on you know how to hack around it to to get explicit instructions for bomb making, right? Uh, those are the kinds of things that, uh, especially as you, if you're not controlling the inputs and you're learning from who knows what people are putting into the model based on whatever prompts and, and whatever data you're pointing it at. Well, I mean, we've, people have tradition, traditionally, in the last two decades, used large search engines for diagnostic purposes, right? I mean, right. and you can imagine, you can imagine these LLMs that are, uh, publicly available being used for diagnostic or treatment or therapy purposes. Um, you want to see regulation come out of that? Have, have, like you said, Bernard, have somebody use one, have a broad set of population use one and bad things happen, right? This is the, the Thorac 25 or the thalidomide of digital health the scenario we're talking there about. There you go, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Couple other interesting things. You know what? I want to take a couple of questions that came in here. Oh, here's one. It's it's a all right. Well, it's a little off point, but if AI summarizes a doctor's report, is that a CMD the FDA regulates? Probably not. Depends on how you end up using the report, but typically, if it's yeah. To, probably not. I, you'd have to, the devil would be in the details. I hate these kind of questions because they're so broad that the details, if it's intended, the product's intended purpose and the labeling and the claims you make and what you say, I'll go into whether it's regulated or not, but uh, uh, something that would summarize from doctor's notes as a historical record would not be. Something like that, that then uses an input for additional diagnostic or health decisions. I mean, again, what, what happens is somebody puts it on the market, right? It, it, it either flies under the radar and no problems. And so then there's no reason for somebody to step in or you have a problem and then the regulators step in and say, well, you know, we, we consider it a, a device because of this. And then they take action on it. Right. right. So often a lot of this is is uh, ask, asking forgiveness, especially if it's in the gray area. That happens a lot. Were, 
in a scenario the next couple of years where the FDA is going to have a decision about how many smackdowns it wants to do, because clearly I don't think anybody disputes you get an exciting new technology, you get tech people, particularly ones who aren't from healthcare jumping in. Um, how many SAMDs are available on some of the commercial download platforms that don't have any sort of regulatory clearance or approval? There's lots of them out there. People, I mean, and this is going to happen. People are going to try to place things on the market th through creative rationalization. And it's it's the regulator's job to go you know, figure them out. This is a great use of AI for the regulators, right? Yeah. Basically go and have the AI, you know, basically crawl and find and, and you know, being able to sort of, uh, make the job of, of let's say, you know, uh, surveillance <laughs> of what's out there uh, and what should be investigated uh, a, a lot easier, right? And auto-generating <laughs> letters and things like that for review by people, right? Certainly would make a lot of sense, yeah. Let's talk about one other quality concern that's come up that's emerging um and i think well as as the workforce changes with their experience with this stuff will emerge which is uh, you used an autonomous car example bernard you know tesla has a largely autonomous mode you could drive across the country without touching your wheel but they tell you you have to keep your hands on the wheel you have to pay attention at all times right it's not a substitute for you but people aren't doing that necessarily so so should we assume that when we say, well, the AI is there to help, but it's still ultimately the doctor's diagnosis? Is that a concern? And or sure. the other concern I would throw out is what happens when we've trained a generation of doctors who have never practiced without AI and don't have that sniff test ability? Is it still reasonable to say, well, the doctor still got to certify it if we never really trained the doctor how? Do you think these are things that might become more is issues in the future? Sure, absolutely, right? I, I, I think um, that, I mean, now it, you have to uh, think about that and look at that, whether it's AI or not. I mean, if you have a tool that is doing automated testing, right? And you're testing, I'm gonna test this on 50 different browsers, right? Um, and it's gonna be an automated test. In that case, you're relying on that tool, right? Um, and you need to validate that that tool meets its intended purpose, that it works, right? And that you're managing any risks of failure and what those risks of failure are. In a case like that, where you have a, you know, something where at the beginning, I think the car analogy is uh, is is a great one. At the beginning, someone is actually not going to trust that thing and they're going to be right in front of it and making sure that it does what it needs to do but if after you know two hours three hours or however long they're going to say you know what i'm gonna step back and relax right i'm just going to trust the tool then you may lose that and so i think that's a that is hard to test for in a normal scenario right where, where you're if you're thinking about it because it relies on like human beings to do certain things right constantly that are against like against how we work right if something is working we're not going to be locked in and paying attention to it uh because brain needs to use that you know that energy somewhere else there's lots of other places for us to do that. So that has to be part of your risk management process when using tools and things like that, right? And do you think that the sort of the underlying human factors assumptions about human behavior will evolve with time as we, you know, get more used to these tools? Always, they always will. And, I'm, but I think that's the other thing is sort of like, you know, you're right. The more we are dependent on tools in our lives in general, right? Uh, How many people used to be able to re read a map? How many people can use a map, read a map? How many people are reliant <laughs> on 
direction finding to get somewhere in a way that we didn't used to before. I think my kids are far less aware of what is where and like take their phone away, be able to get there than, uh, than I was certainly at their age. Right. Um, and I, I think Randy, that the, the regulators understand that, that over time there's this increasing reliance. And I think what you're going to see and, and probably have already seen is an expectation that the, the AI performs better than a human because they, they, there's this understanding that over time that the supervisor is going to become less effective at it, right? The person that's monitoring the AI. Um, and are we going to get better data about how bad that really is? Yeah, we are. And, but realize it happens even when you have two humans involved in the process. If one, one is very effective, the other one realizes that they never find anything. So they just don't, over time, they don't do it. Uh, it's human nature. And uh, I think those same things are going to exist here. And I do, I, but I do think that the expectation of performance of the AI models in terms of its comparison with the gold standard is not going to be just a little bit better than the gold standard. I think you're going to see it, the, the request to be dramatically better than the gold standard. It will accelerate our brain shrinking, which has already yes. been happening for a very, very long time. So. <laughs> Um, there's a question here. I'm going to, I'm going to read it out and then I'm going to repeat what I think the question is asking. Um, I love how it's phrased. How can we expect AI to anticipate a black swan when we feed AI with white swans? So I would read that as, are we submitting enough exception case and problematic cases to AI to train it? Um, you know, the example I, I once read was that um, that for a while, some of the university autonomous car makers, not the manufacturers, but some university programs were training autonomous car AI, couldn't generate enough data for exception scenarios. So they started having their uh, their programs play Grand Theft Auto because you'd have like, you know, things falling in the street, and, you know, people running out and all these crazy scenarios. And that was one of the things they did. So are we, how do we think about what training data to feed in either for positive or negatives or hallucinations or whatever. I mean, you know, what's the nature of, of, a, of a black swan versus a white swan, right? The, the methodology would be study lots of black swans and turn them into white swans, right? Uh, which may work to reduce the number of black swans and certainly your ability Again, what uh, 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 there there are things where right humans are making decisions on training data, right? But maybe you can you know is is something a black swan because we just weren't considering certain data, right? Um, as part of our model, we had bad models of some kind, right? That had flaws in some way. Can we improve our models uh, by studying more uh, and by paying attention to those things or by randomly just generating <laughs> stuff and, and testing things? Yes, we can. Can we eliminate black swans that way? My guess is we will have fewer and bigger ones. <laughs> to be honest, right? I, I think everything you said is right. I mean, I, the, the, the black swans in that analogy seem to me to be the stuff you can't, you, you, you don't necessarily contemplate because they're very rare, right? They're not the normal part of a data set. But we do, I mean, today, what do we do with, we, we augment with those known black swans, not the unknowns, we, but we say, okay, here's our normal distribution of the population. And Here's some things on the, on the periphery that we want to diagnose or we want to take into account. And we augment our data set with those black swans. Now, what we talked about earlier was using generative AI to create larger data sets. And you might be able to create some black swans with those large data sets, right? I mean, it, it's, it's entirely possible. On purpose and it, or on accident? <laughs> Well, look, I mean, augmentation has been a part of how we how we do clinical trials for a long time, right? You say, okay, I'm going to recruit a bunch of people, but I I know I'm not going to get enough of this subset or 
a representative subset because they don't exist in the population. So I'm going to go recruit specifically those people and then put them into the trial. I, this is going to happen with and already happens with training data for for um, for ML models. The, the question is, where do you get them? And, you know, if you were you, you could probably create them, too. It's an interesting question. Um, yeah. I, but expecting an AI model to do more than you train it with. I, you know, that that's a little beyond my technical expertise, but I think it would be rather difficult for the, the extrapolations would probably not be. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I have to think about that a little more. I mean, you know, it, it would certainly be interesting. Again, how good is the data or what kind of analogies can you draw from data? But if you study black swan events, right, across history, let's just say, or in particular areas, do you have good enough data to be able to sort of say, this is where we were and this is this is why this occurred, right? And this was the failure of analysis or or what have you. Uh, maybe you can draw something out of that um, either through study or through, uh, you know, AI potentially generating scenarios for kind of gaps that you might have um, in, in your, you know, whatever theoretical framework in in terms of your data collection in terms of your testing uh etc but that's really interesting you could actually have gener ai generate a list of really really improbable things you never thought of just so you explicitly say no i'm i'm choosing to ignore that one i don't believe that's possible so therefore i'm not taking into account yeah but again it's, it's sort of you're you likely have some kind of a let's say scientific model or something like that, right? Uh, that you are starting with how you determine truth, right? If, and, and these are, you know, theories, right? They explain certain things. Uh, and then we get more data and we find that, well, maybe super string theory isn't really all of that because now we have new data that we have to think about a new model. Right. So that's the nature of, of, of human knowledge or learning or even machine knowledge, right, is uh, you're always going to get more data and there's always going to be something newer or better or something different than fits the uh, explanation. There's no, you know, Newtonian physics only explains it locally. Right. But it worked really, really well for a very long period of time. But is it the truth? No, it's a model that it, that explains things, right? Um, yeah. So let me let me close here. I think we're we're a good time to wrap up. We got a contrarian question before the webinar came that I really like because I actually think it, it it raises a good question. Given all this talk about what will it take to put generative AI in live generative AI inside a medical device, and the question is, is there even a need or benefit to do that? <laughs> Or really, is this is this just a cool solution in search of a problem? The idea of having live generative AI in a medical device. I mean, this gets into sort of like what is a medical device and what is whatever, right? But you could certainly, you know, you can see in the practice of medicine and of helping people improve their health or prevent certain things that there are benefits, whether that is a medical device or not is a different question, right? But let's just take the scenario where I don't have, you know, when you go to an urgent care place, right? In some cases, there's gonna be a doctor there, right? trained in emergency medicine or what have you, or internal medicine or just family practice. A lot of cases, it's going to be a nurse. In many cases, it's going to be some kind of a technician, uh, someone who is an assistant. They're not even trained as a nurse or as a doctor. That is your first line of defense. That's going to say, oh, you've got this thing. What is it, et cetera, right? Given that circumstances. And we're going to see more and more of that uh, uh, happening. 
are you better off having, you know, a really powerful generative AI thing that can find certain things and generative AI with bounds inside of it that is helping that person um, as a companion or not having that there? So if the standard of care is almost like an economist who says, you know, the answer to the problem first, assuming you have a can opener, if, if, if the standard of care in a gold standard is somebody who's triple board certified in neurology, oncology, and neuro-oncology, right? <laughs> How many people can get to that person, especially when you look at the, the trends right now on, you know, in our healthcare workforce and, and the needs coming? So, yeah. So I think that's the, you know, that, that's the, that's kind of, that's the scenario where I could see, again, the standard of care is, and in many of these cases, theoretically, there's a doctor, but there's not really a doctor. I, 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 I have been in these situations myself and my wife, who's an anesthesiologist, you know, criticizes me. Why did you go there? They don't even have an, it's not even not a doctor. It's not even a nurse. Why did you go there? It's like, it hurt. I had to do something. It was immediate. And so I just went to the first one I could find, right? The places where practice and the gold standard is, is based a lot on, on limited learning and anecdotal information can benefit dramatically from large data sets and analysis of large data sets. And that's in that whole diagnostic space that I think we've seen a lot of traction already with ML, right? Places where machines can do stuff better and more precisely than a human. They pay attention to detail better. And you talk about like, as we get better at biometrics and monitoring the human body, uh, an AI, a generative AI model to help you diagnose what might be wrong with you based upon huge data sets of, 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 biometric data and what the outcomes were and what the trip could be, could be transformative. You take the, you take the lowest common denominator out of healthcare, which unfortunately is a human sometimes. I, I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way, but it's the best we've got today, but man, it won't be tomorrow. I also think, you know, even, so we take that, but even the highest common denominator one, look, uh, I, I've I've seen this in action where you've got a whole bunch of doctors that are trained specialists, right? And I've had, you know, family members where it's like everyone is a doctor of, you know, I got an oncologist, I have an anesthesiologist, I have an electrophysiologist, I have a psychiatrist, et cetera. And, and looking at a family member and what is wrong with this person, what's going on and how do we treat coming up with treatment plans, six different people with six different lenses, uh, with uh, you know different points of view, all highly skilled board certified uh, uh, physicians teaching at, at academic medical centers. And there isn't agreement <laughs> between, uh, uh, between these people. Part of that is just the amount of not, the reason we have specializations is the amount of knowledge is too much for any one individual. That's why we have these specializations and sub-specializations where, well, first you go to internal medicine, then you do cardiology, and then you do electrophysiology, pediatric and adult, which are, you know, are separate. All of these kinds of things are continuing to happen. The amount of knowledge that and sort of base knowledge as expressed in inches of text for uh, for uh, each board, each time you do a board certification, in many cases doubles every five years. So the ability of a person to keep all of this in mind is really, really difficult. And so this is another place where I think generative AI as a tool for helping coordinate and bring things together could be really, really helpful, right? Yeah. No, it makes Is that a medical sense. device? Probably not, <laughs> not initially, but is it a tool that helps make, you know, us more productive, makes people more productive? I think that's where, you know, that's really the, 
what I would say is the, you know, next five, 10 years, that's where we're going to have really, really important and really, really good uses of AI and generative AI, right? Not necessarily transformative breakthrough things, but making what we're doing better and, you know, multipliers on, 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 on those things. Just helping us know what we know, so to speak. Yeah. Access what we know as a, as a, as a collective group. Mm -hmm. There's a, there was a study that came out a couple of years ago. I don't remember the exact numbers, but the idea was basically if you were a medical professional, you wanted to read everything that came out and you sat down every night and read for two hours at the end of the first year, you'd be like 627 years behind in reading. That's um, why we, hence why we have specialists, but we can do better than that with, with large data models, a lot better. Excellent. Well, with that, that's a, a good positive, uh, example to end on. I want to thank all of you who came and stuck out. Well, we're 90 minutes and I think we're over about 30% of the people. So we would appreciate it. All of you have come. We'll see you again in late June for our webinar on PCCP and uh, reach out to us in the meantime with feedback, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We can only learn and get better if you help train our models for us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.